Hello and welcome to Worldview, where we take you on a weekly adventure into one intriguing story around the world. The coronavirus outbreak, which is now a global pandemic, is making headlines, causing anxieties, and restricting people to their homes everywhere it goes. While countries are scrambling to come up with a plan, Taiwan is one of the most often mentioned references. While it's not a member of the WHO, Taiwan has always been known for its advanced medical services and an affordable healthcare system. 17 years ago, the island withstood the outbreak of SARS, and now it is standing strong in the storm of COVID-19. Now, Taiwan is just off the southeastern coast of mainland China, and there's a huge amount of people traveling back and forth. But as of the time of taping, the 12th of March, Taiwan has only reported 50 confirmed infections. So how did Taiwan manage to contain the spread of the virus? We've been telling stories from all over the world. For this episode, though, we're going to talk about the battle for our beloved home, Taiwan. In 2003, the outbreak of SARS, which is also caused by coronavirus, triggered tremendous fear in the whole country. It infected more than 300 people and took away 73 lives. The experience left a scar in Taiwanese hearts, but also taught us a valuable lesson. The government became more vigilant than ever before. After Taiwan got off the list of SARS infected area, existing laws were updated to include new regulations for biolab management to avoid lab infections. And later on, many protocols and equipment set up for SARS were used as parts of general disease prevention, such as quarantining infected patients in their close contacts and having infrared thermometer at the airport to monitor conditions of the travelers. All of these came in very handy for fighting the novel coronavirus. It's also worthy to note the performance of the government this time around. After COVID-19 broke out in Wuhan, China, Taiwanese officials soon formed the Central Epidemic Command Center, which played a pivotal role in coordinating swift responses across government agencies. One example would be Taiwan's quick decision to ban flights from Wuhan and enhance health inspections at the border, even before a single case was confirmed. While monitoring the outbreak around the clock and taking preemptive actions, the CECC also kept citizens well informed on the possible symptoms, proper precautions, and the latest situation with daily press conferences, sometimes twice a day. As a leading figure in the battle, Chief Commander of CECC Health Minister Chen Shih-chung has been praised by the public for his performance. And perhaps out of sheer luck, a number of key central government officials also happen to be public health professionals. So it could be argued that the administration has an edge in dealing with the situation. While the CECC focused on the front lines, the Executive Yuan, which is the highest executive body of Taiwan, works with other issues that stand for the epidemic. Solving the uh, shortage of surgical masks is a well-known example. In order to secure supply for future medical use and stabilize the price, the government banned the export of face masks and took over its production as well as distribution. Right now, while surgical masks are out of stock in most countries, Taiwan's surgical mask production capacity is close to 10 million a day, which means everyone will be able to purchase five per person per week and more masks will be rationed to hospitals and clinics. Information technology is another great force in this fight. At the beginning of the outbreak, Taiwanese government merged the National Health Insurance Database with the Immigration and Customs Database so that they can keep track of people's health condition and travel history all at the same time. This big data has provided crucial information for policy making and helped raise the public awareness. Technology also helped when everyone was worried about whether or not the masks are being distributed evenly. At first, the distribution system took a lot of heat from communities due to limited stock and the long waiting queue. One Taiwanese programmer, therefore, created an online mask supply tracking map to make things easier for his own friends and family. This individual project instantly went viral. And Audrey Tang, Taiwan's digital minister, soon reached out to the programmer and his team. Within a matter of days, local IT talents and the government turned this idea into a national real-time map for people to track how many masks are still in stock and where. This action by Tang has earned herself the nickname Genius Minister from Japanese media. 
At this moment, considering most people with a full-time job don't really have the time to go and buy masks from local drugstores, the government has begun testing an online mask purchasing system which should reduce the hassle in getting one. While containing the outbreak is crucial, finding a way to treat the disease is equally important. At this point, there's no vaccine or specific treatment for COVID-19 yet, but the WHO has announced that remdesivir, an experimental drug, may be effective in treating the disease. Taiwan's medical professionals now have the ability to synthesize remdesivir on their own. A team from National Health Research Institutes announced in late February that they have successfully synthesized remdesivir at the gram level. That doesn't mean the drug is widely available right away, but this is a key step in making a potential solution viable. As the demand to test potential patients continue to rise, the Academia Seneca announced in early March that they have successfully developed antibodies for COVID-19 virus tests in only 19 days, two months ahead of schedule. Theoretically, this milestone means the time it takes to confirm an infection will be reduced from four hours to just 15 to 20 minutes. The virus test still has to wait for months of human testing and FDA evaluation before mass production, but this is obviously great news for Taiwan. So far into the outbreak, the number of infected cases in Taiwan is significantly lower than in China and other neighboring countries like Japan and South Korea, even when considering the difference in population sizes. However, there are still obstacles that need to be tackled on the path to victory. First and foremost, misinformation and disinformation have from time to time created unnecessary public panic in Taiwan. For example, in early February, a woman who sells sanitary supplies put out a rumor saying that there will soon be a shortage in toilet paper supply because the material for sanitary products are all being used for face mask production. Even though the two products are not made with the same material, Taiwanese rushed into stores and bought every last toilet paper roll on the shelf. The government immediately cleared us up online with a rather rare butt joke, supposedly by the premier himself, while strictly enforced laws punishing the spread of disinformation. At the same time, however, there are still many unchecked messages popping up on social media at every second that may stir up emotions. Secondly, there are still blind spots that need to be addressed. The 32nd infected case, for example, is an undocumented caregiver from Indonesia who used to work for an infected patient. Due to the lack of her immigration information, it took the authority quite some time to track her down for inspection and quarantine. Now, this incident sparked a controversy. Should the government crack down on illegal migration workers at this unusual time? In the end, the government decided to stay focused on fighting the virus first. Instead of arresting illegal migration workers, they will be included as part of the pandemic control. Taiwan just went through a dramatic presidential election in January that saw generational conflicts and division in the society. But as COVID-19 hit, the administration, the opposition, and members of public from different political affiliation are, in one way or another, united in this fight. If Taiwan serves as a success story to the world, however, it must not be forgotten that the men and women in healthcare who are already working incredibly long hours and under great pressure, even before all of this begins, probably deserves a most sincere thank you. This is Worldview. I'll see you in the next video. 国际大风吹节目呢，即将要迎来第一百集喽。那下一集我们想做一个比较特别的 Q&A 专辑，所以如果你对节目内容或者是我们团队有任何的疑问的话，欢迎你在下方留言，我们会挑一些出来，在下一集当中全部一次回答。最后当然还是要感谢我们的频道会员，尤其是干爹干妈们：翁一顺、周宣厚、资玲丽、吴晨